today we'll be starting with another cardinal manifestation in uh, uh, through harrisons um, which is uh, dyspepsia this is the first in the gi complaints that we are seeing um, so as usual i have combined uh, about three to three chapters from harrisons uh, for this uh, session and uh, yeah, like uh, like all my other uh, previous sessions each individual sentence if uh, i am not mentioning is directly picked up from harrisons and i have quoted the reference back there so why is dyspepsia important? And uh, currently, actually, in the current edition of Harrison's or the previous editions, dyspepsia is not as a chapter anywhere. That is because of a slight confusion that is there in the definition of dyspepsia. So today I have uh, spoken about dyspepsia, uh, the approach to a patient with dyspepsia. And first of all, what is dyspepsia? Um, I will uh, I will not talk about any particular disease in detail because that will end up taking a lot of time. So I'm giving a general overview of the causes, etiology, and approach to dyspepsia. And we can revisit the important causes of the diseases causing dyspepsia further on. So uh, what is dyspepsia? So first of all, we have to understand this entire symptom complex called indigestion. So dyspepsia is hidden in Harrison's under the chapter called indigestion. That is because the word dyspepsia, actually the etymology comes from dys, which means bad or uh, um, um, not functioning properly and pepsia or pepsis, which means digestion. So the word dyspepsia actually means the etymology of dyspepsia actually means the inability to digest or difficulty in digestion or maldigestion. So this actually the chapter heading in Harrison's is called as indigestion. So if you just go and read that chapter of indigestion today, you will find that a lot of points have been uh, 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 mixed inside uh, the chapter, which is not dyspepsia. They have brought in other symptoms like regurgitation, abdominal pain. They brought regurgitation back and forth. So what I have tried to do is I have tried to formulate what is dyspepsia and what are the close, co close components of dyspepsia, but that is not exactly by definition dyspepsia. So dyspepsia by etymology goes as impaired digestion, but that is not the current working definition of dyspepsia. So we are going to understand the, what is the symptom complex of indigestion and what is the cause of dyspepsia. We are going to understand the approach to an, uninvest an uninvestigated case of dyspepsia. We are going to see the most common cause of dyspepsia overall, be it in medical or surgical disciplines, that is functional dyspepsia. Then we are going to see the most important cause, which is peptic ulcer disease. Okay. If we have time, we'll go and touch about the next most important cause, which is NSI gastro. So the most important cause of dyspepsia is functional. If it's not functional, then it is most common causes peptic ulcer disease. If you go back to the previous uh, class, wherein I've spoken about fatigue, I have told you that the most important cause of fatigue is actually secondary causes. Most of 99, 90 to 95% of the causes of fatigue, you actually can find out it will be a separate disease. If you treat the disease, the fatigue already uh, always comes down. But in this class, we are understanding that dyspepsia, most of the cause of dyspepsia are primary. That means they're functional and nothing can be found on investigations. And the secondary causes, the most important, which takes up the entire cake is peptic ulcer disease. So if you've understood this brief uh, uh, summary, I'll come to what is dyspepsia. So dyspepsia is basically, I'll talk about it. Yeah. So let us say this uh, dyspepsia is basically defined by the Rome 4 criteria. Okay. So Rome 4 criteria actually defines dyspepsia as any particular symptom or uh, a sign that is restricted due to a pathology in the gastroduodenal region. Okay, so anything in the gastroduodenal region, any pathology arising in the gastroduodenal region, the symptom that it produces is called dyspepsia. Now, the dys dyspepsia is a symptom that is, uh, the, it's, a, it's a, in fact a syndrome that is commonly associated with other symptoms like regurgitation or it could be acid reflux or it could be water brash, etc. These symptoms are, dyspepsia can most likely be associated with these symptoms. But by definition, dyspepsia is any particular symptom or sign that is arising due to pathology in the gastroduodenal lumen. Now, the most important cause of dyspepsia is 70% of it is functional. That means to say you never find any particular ulcer, any particular tumor or any particular pathology by cursory examination, by examination in the, of the lumen via the scope. The rest of the 30% of the cases are secondary. They're, they're, used to, uh, they're due to a particular cause. And most important cause is a peptic ulcer disease. So there's a peptic ulcer disease and that is causing dyspeptic symptoms. But now what are these dyspeptic symptoms? So dyspeptic symptoms are basically either two types. One is 
early satiety. Second one is post prandial fullness. Okay, these two. On the other side, you have epigastric burning. And then you have epigastric pain. So these four uh, problems define dyspepsia according to the Rome 4 criteria. Now, either the patient has the first two or the second two or a complex of both. If they are having predominantly the first two, which are related to a meal or in fact, after a particular meal, they are called as postprandial distress syndrome. If only those two are present in majority of the time, they are called as postprandial distress syndrome. If the patient has epigastric burning and epigastric pain, more often than the first two, then they are called as epigastric pain syndrome. So overall, dyspepsia, the most common cause is functional and the functional cause can be uh, divided into four causes, four uh, ways. Early satiety, postprandial fullness, which both encompass postprandial distress syndrome. And then you have epigastric burning and epigastric pain, which com com encompass epigastric pain syndrome. Now, if these symptoms are present for more than three months and the onset was six months ago, I'll repeat, if both of these symptoms are present for more than three months and the onset was six months ago, then we call this functional dyspepsia only if the examination, USG, endoscopy, everything was normal and did not reveal any peptic ulcer disease. For all practical purposes in today's class, whenever I talk about the secondary causes or the known causes, I will restrict to peptic ulcer disease because that is one of the most common causes. Okay. The other causes can be as uh, disastrous as gastric cancer. It could be an SI related gastropathy. Okay. It could be other drugs. Okay. It could be more very importantly, a pancreatic or biliary disorder. This, all of these are inside the lumen. They're luminal disorders, whereas pancreatic or biliary disorders are obviously outside the lumen, but eventually cause a problem in the lumen. Now, pancreatic or biliary disorders are extremely easy to find out, catch and rule out. That is because the symptoms, they, they might have jaundice, they might have history of alcoholism, they might have symptoms that are radiating the right upper, upper quadrant, they might have abnormalities in the enzymes. So LFT would definitely pick up. So pancreatic obliterate disorders would definitely get picked up much easier than the other disorders. Peptic ulcer disease, unless you go and do an endoscopy, you might not find out. So unless proven otherwise, I will tell that the secondary cause of dyspepsia is peptic ulcer disease, unless proven otherwise. Okay. Now, so when I've told about the four important symptoms of dyspepsia, which are early satiety, postprandial fullness, epigastric burning and epigastric pain, what I should be able to tell you what are not in the dyspepsia, dyspepsia spectrum. That is regurgitation. That is heartburn. Okay. So heartburn, regurgitation, acid reflux, water brash, these symptoms are not dyspepsia by itself. Dyspepsia can exist with these symptoms, but they are not the defining symptoms in dyspepsia. So what is heartburn? Heartburn, when the patient describes heartburn, it is basically when there is an epigastric burning sensation and the, the burning sensation rises up retrosternally and radiates up to the neck and the shoulder region. So you can feel it retrosternally and you can feel the burn ascending up. That is basically called pyrosis or heartburn. Okay, this is what is heartburn. Now, that is obviously different from any of these particular symptoms. Early satiety, postprandial fullness, epigastric burning will remain in the epigastric region and it does not radiate upward. And epigastric pain, these symptoms are not related to heartburn. Regurgitation. Regurgitation and rumination are two important symptoms. Regurgitation is basically when there are involuntary expulsion of gastric contents after you've eaten, about an hour after you've eaten, especially in the night when you are supine and when you have certain risk factors associated with regurgitation. So the food actually comes out and you can feel that the indigestion associated with it is because of the food and not the acid per se. That is called as regurgitation. And a, a similar symptom is acid regurgitation and water brush. Now, these are symptoms which are related to a problem in the distal esophagus when because of the vagal reaction, the salivary secretion itself in the mouth increases. So you have a patient who is complaining that he's salivating more and there was a particular episode in the night wherein he has to use a towel in which he was saliv salivating more and more. 
This is called as water brash, which is basically a protective mechanism for a distal esophageal problem, like a mucosal injury due to acid or bile, that the saliva is increasing so, so that the acid is diluted. So this is acid reflux and water brash. So all these symptoms now come under a big complex of upper abdominal problems, upper GI problems. This is in contrast to diarrhea, constipation, altered bowel movements, bloating, etc. So these symptoms like early satiety, postprandial fullness, epigastric burning, epigastric pain are all dyspeptic symptoms. They can or need not be associated with heartburn or pyrosis, which is an ascending epigastric burning that radiates retrosternally. They could be regurgitation, which is involuntary expulsion of the gastric contents after an hour of eating. They could be water brush. So the symptoms that we learned in the last, the first four symptoms can be present in moderate to severe gastroesophageal or esophageal problems. So typical example is GERD. In GERD, you have an acidic reflux. So because of the lo lax lower esophageal sphincter, a patient presents with heartburn regurgitation more than any of the lower dyspeptic symptoms. Dyspeptic symptoms can be present, but if you take proper history and ask the patient, he will complain of the upper box rather than the lower box. S similarly, in a patient with dyspepsia, if you have diagnosed a patient with dyspepsia, he will present the lower symptoms more than the upper symptoms. But he can have some amount of upper symptoms also, but does, that does not mean the patient is jerked. Okay. So when you've understood these two particular uh, uh, symptoms properly, we'll go on to uh, our starting slide, which is dyspepsia is a constellation of symptoms referable to the gastroduodenal region of the upper GI tract and not the esophagus. So problems with inside the esophagus, leaving alone the gastric junction, okay, which could be involved, the pure esophageal problems will not present with dyspeptic symptoms and dyspeptic symptoms are four. Okay. Now, heartburn may occur as a part of the symptom constellation, but the criteria says that the, when the heartburn is a predominant symptom, the patient should be considered to have jerd more than anything else. Okay. Jerd with dyspepsia is possible, but dyspepsia with jerd cannot be possible if heartburn is the predominant symptom. Only four symptoms, like I told you, fullness, early sat uh, satiation, uh, epigastric pain and epigastric burning are considered specifically to be of gastroduodenal origin. Now, uninvestigated dyspepsia is what we are going to learn today. And uninvestigated case of dyspepsia is that case which has not been diagnosed or given a name, basically. The patient has been suffering a lot, but nobody has given a particular name for it. And particular luminal tests have to be done. For example, endoscopy. Like I told you, 70% of the causes, unlike our previous class, 70% of the causes here are functional where you don't find anything else. So, and please remember the common word that everybody uses is gastritis and gastritis is a histologically determined term. It is not an, uh, the mucosal erythema that we see during endoscopy also. And gastritis can, uh, cannot be used with dyspepsia. Gastritis can cause dyspepsia, but gastritis is not neither an uh, endoscopical, endoscopic term nor a, a clinical syndrome term. So it has to be driven out of our vocabulary. Like I told you, these symptoms are not dyspepsia, not dyspepsia, okay? One is heartburn or pyrosis, which is basically a burning feeling in the stomach or lower chest and radiating upward to the neck and throat and occasionally to the back. This is postprandial, most commonly supine, night time. And interestingly, the extent or the severity of the esophageal damage is never uh, proportional to the amount of symptoms. The symptoms can be very severe, but the esophageal damage may be very less. It's all about visceral hyper, uh, hypersensitivity. So the uh, uh, damage is not proportional to the amount of symptoms. Heartburn, why it's important for us to realize the difference between heartburn and uh, uh, dyspepsia is because, and regurgitation is because heartburn responds to PPI much, much better than regurgitation. Regurgitation will not respond to PPI as much as heartburn. They might respond, but heartburn is the best, uh, is best uh, relieved by good amount of high dose PPI therapy, complete duration PPI therapy. Odinophagia is when there is a severe ulcerative esophagitis or pill induced esophagitis, there is painful swallowing. Okay. Then you have regurgitation, which I've already told you where the patient has more esophagitis in endoscopy, 
patient has a low lax lower in esophageal sphincter and gastroparesis could be present that is when the regurgitated symptoms will happen and it's more definitively a problem of the esophagus and the esophagogastric junction rather than the stomach and the duodenum water brush i've told you is the salivary glands that are secreting more saliva because of the uh, injury uh, in the esophagus in the distal esophagus so all these symptoms you have to sit and ask your patients to determine whether the problem is occurring predominantly in the esophagus and the esophagogastric junction or in the gastroduodenal region why it's important for you to determine at the level of history itself is because any patient with comes with any problem in the U uGI tract it's more often than not that you go and put a uGI scope and see what's happening if you put a uGI scope and if you find that the patient has more of esophageal symptoms but you found some particular gastric cancer in the antrum or the pylorus the symptoms are not co coinciding with the um, disease with the endoscopic diagnosis so that means there is some kind of mismatch that is happening so you have to go and evaluate the esophagus properly if you are sure and if the patient is sure that the patient has regurgitant symptoms heartburn and not any of the dyspeptic symptoms then finding a pathology in the gastroduodenal region becomes incidental this is very important if you're finding an incidental lesion in the gastroduodenal region but the symptoms are of esophageal origin then you have to do a, a check diagnosis again you have to do other tests and you have to revisit the diagnosis and history again that is why it becomes important at the level of history and the cardinal manifestations are separate for esophagus and esophagogastric junction and the gastroduodenal tract so that's why it's very important for you to know all these symptoms one is dyspepsia and the four symptoms under dyspepsia then you have esophageal symptoms which are more of heartburn, odynophagia, regurgitation and water brush. So when we have clearly delineated this, let's go back and revise what is important. What are the important causes of dyspepsia? There's a line that I've drawn. This is the most important cause because this there is nothing that is found in the esophageal uh, uh, UGS copy. So that is functional dyspepsia, which is 70% of the causes. This functional dyspepsia can either be postprandial distress syndrome or epigastric pain syndrome. These have two and these have two. Put together, it is dyspepsia. The most, in the secondary causes, the most important one is peptic ulcer disease. Most of them will have peptic ulcer disease. If anything else is there, then you have to treat it separately. But the current guidelines, the current algorithms will assume that the patient has peptic ulcer disease and the algorithm is driven in such a way to rule out the peptic ulcer disease than to rule in any of these. Please understand. So our entire session today will be driven by this particular table because what I'm saying is now functional dyspepsia if you find then good you can probably treat it but you're not supposed to miss any of the other things that are below most important peptic ulcer disease because it has a high you can treat it very well if you find it early and you can have a lot of complications if you don't treat it early so that's why peptic ulcer disease is very important now when you've understood this the entire algorithm for a patient or an approach to a patient of dyspepsia will not have symptoms of uh, will not have jerd in its diagnostic algorithm they will not have achalasia cardia will not have esophageal cancer so please don't put any of that in uh, the algorithm of dyspepsia it might be a junctional cancer but not above the junction okay so any patient with an approach to an un uninvestigated of a case of dyspepsia, you have to understand that you are going to just go and find out if there is a peptic ulcer disease. If you find a peptic ulcer disease, then go ahead and treat it. If you don't find a peptic ulcer disease, then assume it is functional dyspepsia because all of these are too rare and we are going to find out uh, if the, any of these are present, if you do a duodenoscopy immediately or a simple USG will definitely tell us or a simple LFT will tell us there's a pancreatic biliary disorder. So our algorithm today will be based on the fact of whether we are going to find any particular symptoms or signs suggestive of uh, peptic ulcer disease. So how do you find this peptic ulcer disease? So you have to understand if you uh, if you go back to all your algorithms in Harrison's or Slicinger or up to date or wherever the algorithm is slightly confusing. So I've tried to make it very simple. Now in a case of dyspepsia, if you found those four symptoms that are present. Please understand this is irrespective of whether other symptoms are present or not. If the other symptoms are present, then we can make a diagnosis of JERD with dyspepsia. We can make a diagnosis of IBS with dyspepsia. We can make a diagnosis of esophageal cancer with dyspepsia. But today I'm restricting only to dyspepsia when there are four symptoms, one, 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 those four symptoms are present and you want to know if any particular pathology is present or not. So in this case, you're going to find out if 
peptic ulcer disease is present or not. What is the most common cause of peptic ulcer disease? It is H. pylori. That means to say you want to find out if H. pylori is there or not. That's all. Simple. If a case of dyspepsia is present to you truly by history and you have not made a mistake in taking the history, then you have to just find out if H. pylori is present or not. Now, H. pylori can be detected in two ways. One is the most important way, that is UBT, urea breath test. You are going to take breath of the patient. You are not going to do endoscopy. These are non-endoscopic tests. You are going to detect uh, carbon, emission, carbon dioxide emission via putting a urea tablet into the patient's mouth. Urea goes into the stomach, the bacteria helicobacter pylori has urease, so it breaks down urea, releases carbon dioxide. You're going to, you're going to detect the radioisotope of carbon, carbon, carbon dioxide via the exhaled breath and find out if it's positive. Urea breath test and stool antigen test are extremely sensitive and uh, specific compared to others in a case where the prevalence like in India is very high. So you are going to do this particular test, either one of them. If it's positive, then you're going to treat. It's as simple as that. Now, the problem is when the this particular algorithm gets complicated a little. That complication happens when you have particular group of patients in which you're thinking, look, H. pylori not, need not be the only reason why the patient is having dyspepsia. You're, you're suspecting that there's something, some other problem upon uh, H. pylori that is causing uh, dyspepsia. Those patients are called as high-risk groups. So in such high-risk group patients, you are going to tell that this H. pylori could probably would have complicated into a cancer or H. pylori would have complicated into an ulcer, H. pylori could have complicated into a stricture, bleeding, etc., etc. In such patients, you are not just only going to do urea breath test, you're going to go inside the lumen and see if these complications are present or not. That is simply when you understand that if the patient is old, that means he has harbored the H. pylori for a very long time. That means he could have developed cancer or complications. So in a patient who is more than 60 years of age, you are going to suspect that he might have developed complications or there was some other pathology that is leading to dyspepsia or he might have developed cancer. In such patients of more than 60 years or in patients who have complications or features of cancer, what are the features of cancer? You might have weight loss, you might have lymphadenopathy, you might have a bleed, okay? Or if there's persistence of symptoms, even after treatment. So all these symptoms are called as alarm symptoms. So these alarm symptoms, if they're present, or if the patient is more than 60 uh, years, you are going to not use these tests initially. You're going to go for a UGI scopy. Once you go and do a UGI scopy, you're going to take a biopsy of the gastric mucosa, and then you're going to subject it to something called as rapid urease test. Please note that rapid urease test is done endoscopically after a biopsy on the biopsy tissue. Okay. When the biopsy tissue has been taken out, you're going to add reagents and conduct the test. Whereas urea breath test is a non-endoscopic test. But all these tests, urea breath test, stool, antigen, rapid urease have comparable efficacy. Okay. You don't have to worry which is better than the other. Okay. So, but there are limitations to each, but you don't have to worry about uh, problems within each problems like this. Okay. So you are going to use UGI scopy, go inside and find out two things. One, what is the role of UGI scopy? Why are we doing UGI scopy? Like I told you, these group of patients are either become too old or they have showing some signs of symptoms of cancer or complication. So not only are going to prove that there is H. pylori, but you're going to prove that there are some complications. You're going to see if there's any stricture. You're going to see if there's any ulcer or take the biopsy of that ulcer to find out if they're malignant, etc. So now these, this UGI scopy, the main reason for this UGI scopy, if anybody asks, in a case of dyspepsia, in an uninvestigated case of dyspepsia, why do you do UGI scopy? One answer is to rule out early gastric cancer. So this is to mainly rule out early gastric cancer because if you find that the patient has early gastric cancer, you're going to remarkably improve on his success rate of chemotherapy uh, 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 treatment. Okay, so if you pick up an early gastric cancer in a patient of UGI scopy with dyspepsia, that is the success of the entire diagnostic algorithm. Ap apart from the early gastric cancer, you're going to find out if there's any complications of the H. pylori, if it's going to be present. Along with that, you are going to take a biopsy to prove that H. pylori is present. Okay, H. pylori can be proved in any which way. You can use this also to be proved. Okay, but you need not do it because anyway, you're entering inside you might as well take the biopsy, which is the most confirmatory test. Also, you can find if there's any intestinal metaplasia, is there any cancer, is there any complications? That is the role of understanding UGI scopy. Okay. Now, if suppose you went to do this UGI scopy, let us say while doing this UGI scopy, you realize there's a lot of bleeding. 
or there's an entire tumor sitting over there, which is for uh, you're not unable to take a biopsy. If you're unable to take a biopsy to prove for the rapid ureas test, then you will go ahead and do the patient. You're going to do the urea breath test. If you're unable to do the rapid ureas test, but still you're going to do UGI scopy, not for just the diagnosis of H. pylori, but to see any particular complications or any particular features of cancer that they are present. This UGI scopy will go up to the level of uh, D1, D2. It is going up to the bulb. So it can fairly see any symptoms of the gastro duodenal tract. And that is why the symptoms of dyspepsia are told that they are coming from the gastro duodenal tract. So you have to understand that dyspepsia symptoms are re restricted to gastro duodenal tract up to the D1 and D2, second part of duodenum. And in a case of dyspepsia, first thing you do is you see, you want to prove that it is H. pylori because the most common cause of dyspepsia is peptic ulcer disease and that is most commonly caused by H. pylori. So you're going to go and diagnose H. pylori using any particular means. Either urea test, stool antigen test, or, uh, ureus breath test, stool antigen test, or by rapid ureus test. You would otherwise commonly go and do ureus test in everybody. But in case you find that the patient is older than 60, or if you feel that the patient has symptoms and signs of cancer and complications, or if the patient is showing some kind of com uh, com uh, bleeding, GI tract, anemia, uh, unexplained uh, iron deficiency anemia, then you're going to go inside the tract and do the uh, uh, H. pylori diagnosis. Apart from finding out the H. pylori diagnosis, you're also going to go and find out if there are any cancer and complications as you suspected. So if you have gotten any positive result in the H. pylori test here, you're going to go ahead and give treatment for the H. pylori uh, uh, by uh, the uh, treatment that I'm going to tell about. After giving the treatment from, for H. pylori, you are going to give PPI therapy. You are going to give PPI for another two weeks Two weeks is the set minimum duration for the H. pylori treatment, after which you're going to give two more weeks of PPI therapy, and then you're going to confirm eradication. This is a very important treatment. So after treatment, you're going to give PPI, and after PPI, you're going to go confirm eradication. And how do you confirm eradication? Using urea breath test or stool antigen test. So this is the entire algorithm, basic algorithm of dyspepsia. Okay. Now, if you look at this algorithm given by Harrison's, this particular age is the controversy. So a lot of people say it is 60. The current guidelines say it is 60, but Harrison mentions 40. So in a case of new onset dyspe uh, dyspepsia, exclude by history GERD. Why? Why is he excluding GERD? Because GERD does not cause dyspepsia. Please understand that. Or GERD probably can cause dyspepsia as a very minor component in it. After you have ruled out a lot of other symptoms, if you're going to find that the patient has alarm symptoms or is more than 40 years old, then you're directly going to refer him to a gastroenterologist for UGI scopy. If not, you're going to do a non-invasive H. pilot testing, which is what? Urea breath test or stool antigen test. If it's positive, you give the therapy, you're going to confirm. You're going to confirm. If it's negative, then you give a trial of treatment with PPI or H, uh, H2 blockers and then refer the patient for gastroenterology. This is the idea of dyspepsia, dyspepsia algorithm. Okay. Now, what are these al al uh, alarm symptoms? These are the alarm symptoms. Unintentional weight loss, dysphagia or dinophagia, unexplained iron deficiency anemia, persistent vomiting, palpable mass or lymphadenopathy, family history of upper gastric cancer. So these are alarm features. With these alarm features, or if the patient is more than 60 years of age, you first go do a UGSCOPY. And because you've entered the lumen, you are going to take the biopsy and then you're going to subject the patient to a uh, rapid ureus test. If it's positive, then treat it. If it's negative, then label the patient as functional dyspepsia. If it's if the rapid ureus test is negative and you don't find anything in the endoscopy, that is most likely the case because 70% of the endoscopies that you do are normal. Any, in any patient of dyspepsia, you do endoscopy 70% of the time, it is normal. So a rapid urease test is negative in it. All. In such patients, what you're going to do is you're going to label it as functional dyspepsia and you're going to treat the patient as functional dyspepsia. This is the understanding. I hope I'm clear. Now, what is functional dyspepsia? Functional dyspepsia is basically uh, <clears throat> the most common cause of dyspepsia. Okay. Most common cause of dyspepsia is functional dyspepsia. In functional dyspepsia, you have two things, postprandial uh, fullness, sorry, postprandial fullness, epigastric uh, early satiety, uh, which should be present for more than three days a week. And the onset was more than six months and it uh, six months back, and it should last for three months. 
It should last for three months. Similarly, you have uh, epigastric pain syndrome, which is epigastric pain or epigastric burning more than one day per week, onset six months back, but lasting for more than three months. This is basically epigastric pain syndrome. This is basically postprandial distress syndrome. Why it is important for you to differentiate? Because treatment is di uh, different. That is the basic idea. There can be 30% of the patients who have both. Okay, they have all sorts of four symptoms. And one third of these patients can have esophageal symptoms like GERD. Then the diagnosis will become GERD with functional dyspepsia. Or you will not be harmed if you say it is just GERD also. But you will never call those patients as only functional dyspepsia because they have esophageal symptoms. The moment esophageal symptoms comes, then the patient should have something more than functional dyspepsia. Okay. So you look at this. This is an, un, let us say, this is an uninvestigated dyspepsia. Okay. The patient has the four classical symptoms of dyspepsia. In that case, you do endoscopy. If you find something, then it is organic, mainly ulcer. Okay. This esophagitis is query. It might not be present. Functional dyspepsia is what you find most of the time, 70 to 80 percent of the time. If it is functional dyspepsia, you classify it to whether it is meal related. That means postprandial distress or early satiety. It is meal related, or if it is meal unrelated, epigastric pain and burning unrelated to the meal. This is something else. In postprandial distress syndrome, you are going to move the bowel. You are going to give a prokinetic, correct? In an epigastric syndrome, you are not going to give prokinetic. You're, it's meal unrelated, so you are going to give PPI. This is prokinetic. Please understand that the other drug also can be given. This is mainly prokinetic with PPI. This is PPI with prokinetic. This is the first line therapy for FD. So in a case of FD, if you find postprandial distress syndrome, where the patient is suffering for more than three months, if it's meal related, then you're going to give prokinetic as the first therapy. In epigastric pain syndrome, you're going to give PPI as the main therapy. So this is FD or functional dyspepsia. Okay. So Functional dyspepsia is the most common cause of F dyspepsia. In an uninvestigated, correctly diagnosed dyspepsia, functional dyspepsia occupies most of the cases. But what happens is, because of alarm features or as the patient more than 60 years, you're going to do an UGSCOPY and find some other disorder. Now, there is a particular endoscopic technique in which you can pick up early gastric cancers much better. That is called as narrow band imaging. So in narrow band imaging, if, you're, if your scopy has narrow band imaging, it is better to go near the antrum and near the uh, pyloric region and find out if there is a particular features of early gastric cancer. If early gastric cancers are present, then it's better to biopsy and start therapy if it's positive. That is the advantage of doing upfront UGI scopy in these high risk group of patients. Okay. So if anybody asks you, what is the point of doing UGSCOPY in a case of dyspepsia is because these symptoms are present that I want to find out the complications of peptic ulcer disease. I want to find out that if there's any other reason for dyspepsia and also side by side, I want to take biopsy for H pylori testing. That biopsy for H pylori testing, if it doesn't happen also, it's not a problem because you can come out of, you can remove the scope back and you can do ureus test also. I mean, you can do your ureus breath test also. Okay, so the biopsy for the uh, rapid ureus test biopsy is not the ultimate reason why you're doing endoscopy. It is to find out if there's any er erosive esophagitis, if there's any hiatal hernia, and if there's any patient with gastric cancer, polyps, if there's any peptic structure, any particular duodenal issue, etc. For all these symptoms, we're going to do UGSCOPY. Okay, so at this point of uh, uh, in, uh, introduction to dyspepsia symptoms, I'm going to ask you one question. Let us say there's a uh, lady who is 44 year old who is uh, presenting with symptoms of um, postprandial fullness and early satiety, etc. So she is having the symptoms for more than three months. So she is coming to you. She has tried some PPA, but it has not worked. So now what do you do? Now you she's 44 year old and she does not have any alarm features. So in that case, what you do, you're going to test and treat. So basically you're going to test using urea breath test and then going to treat the patient if the urea test, urea, ureus breath test is positive. If it is positive, you're going to give two weeks, that is 14 days treatment. There are multiple durations of treatment. Plus please remember for this level, it is only two weeks. You're going to give two weeks of anti-H pylori treatment and then followed by two weeks of PPI more. So totally four weeks of PPI, two weeks of anti-H pylori treatment. And then you're going to confirm eradication by doing the repeat urea breath test or stool antigen test. Once you've done all this, if the patient improves, then it's fine. If the patient does not improve, persistent symptoms are present or the character of the pains change, then you're going to do UGSCOPY in her also. 
So when you do a UGS copy, if I tell you that you found out that the patient has erosions in the esophagus, suggestive of esophagitis, there's a hiatal hernia, and then there is nothing in the particular nothing in the stomach, or probably a small ulcer in the stomach. Okay, there is an antral ulcer in the stomach. So what are you going to do? And there's some inflammation in the duodenum also. So what are the features in the endoscopy we found in this patient? We're going to find one thing, which is erosive esophagitis, lax esophageal sphincter. You found out that there is some amount of uh, uh, duodenitis in the duodenum. And then there is a small antral ulcer. So what are you going to do? Now, the symptoms that she came from should guide everything. That is why history becomes very important. The symptoms that she came from came uh, with is basically dyspeptic symptoms. If you ask her if there's any regurgitant symptoms, if there's any heartburn, she says no to it. So there's no esophageal or esophagogastric symptoms. So the symptoms are suggestive of dyspepsia. So I'm going to find out if there's any gastroduodenal problem. There is a gastric problem, which is an ulcer, and a duodenal problem, which is small inflammation. Now, which is causing the problem? Now, the duodenal problem, which is small duodenal uh, duodenitis, is called as non-specific duodenitis. Which is basically a non-specific duodenitis is basically common in many people without any particular emphasis. So, please don't go towards the duodenum in 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 case you find that there is non-specific duodenitis. So, take the biopsy from there nonetheless and concentrate on the ulcer. Now, you have found an ulcer in the antrum. You know, you are going to find out if the ulcer is very big or if the ulcer is benign or malignant. That is very important. So, a gastric ulcer is most likely malignant. It has a high malignant potential. So in this case, you're going to biopsy the gastric ulcer. In case, if it's a duodenal ulcer, you need not biopsy it, but a gastric ulcer has to be biopsied to rule out if it is malignant. So you found a particular cause for your dyspeptic symptoms. Now you can call the patient to have peptic ulcer disease. You also are going to take a biopsy for H. pylori. This H. pylori biopsy has a particular protocol, which is called the Sydney protocol, in which you're going to take five biopsies from various parts of the stomach. Okay. So once you've taken the Sydney biopsy, Sydney protocol biopsy for H. pylori, you've taken a biopsy for, for from the uh, uh, ulcer, presumed to be malignant, you're going to come back. But what about the esophageal symptoms and the erosive esophagitis? These symptoms represent a, a state of GERD or non-erosive esophagitis, which has to be dealt later. They are important symptoms, but they're not dyspeptic symptoms. So in that case, you're going to proceed with the diagnosis of GERD. You're going to do a, a test that are relevant for the diagnosis of GERD or any particular uh, algorithm that fits the esophageal problems. Along with it, these particular problems have to be managed. So the patient might have two issues at the same time. That is what I'm trying to tell. So if you have a particular patient with in endoscopy, you have esophageal erosions, ulcer and malignancy. But these are particular diagnoses that have to be, they should have symptoms. You should proceed with a different algorithm altogether. If there's a gastric ulcer, peptic stricture, early gastric cancer, duodenitis, duodenal ulcer, all of these are particular causes of dyspepsia. In this case, you have to do your H. pylori testing via your Sydney protocol. And if it's a gastric ulcer, you have to biopsy it. Or if you have to, if you find that the duodenal ulcer is also looking like it's malignant, then you have to biopsy that also. But most often than not, your endoscopy is always normal. Okay, you have a normal endoscopy. So endoscopy role in dyspepsia management is utmost important. It's upfront in patients with alarm features or with age more than 60. 70% have a normal endoscopy. Then we do it because we want to see if there's any particular early gastric cancer in such patients. Okay. So early gastric cancer picking up gives a remarkable success. Even in a normal UGI scopy, if you have dyspeptic symptoms, you will do a Sydney biopsy to prove the H. pylori. Even if the mucosa are completely normal, you will if there are if there are dyspeptic symptoms and they're persistent, you will have to do a five biopsies of the stomach to uh, subject it to histopathology. You have to put it for histopathology and rapid UAS also. In patients with antral atrophy, if there at any atrophied region, you cannot go for biopsy. It's already atrophied. You might not find H. pylori in it. So if there is atrophy or if the patient is, is do, has done the endoscopy while on PPI and antibiotics, then you have to do the take the biopsy from a proximal region. So you take the biopsy from the fundus. That is because of the proximal migration of the H. pylori. H. pylori requires needs acid for growth. So as if there's an antral atrophy of this PPI therapy, it won't find acid there. So it will migrate up near the fundus, near the corpus and stay there. So in such patients who have antral atrophy or treatment with PPI, you have to take a more proximal biopsy to prove H. pylori. So if you find in the biopsy two things, gastric epithelium with in, uh, intraepithelial lymphocytes and duodenal epithelium with intraepithelial lymphocytes, which is more uh, benign, it's obviously a non-specific duodenitis in duodenum. 
that's why i am telling if you find duodenal inflammation that sometimes might be normal in a uh, in a course of in in a background of anything uh, abnormal uh, non specific duodenitis have to be left alone okay that is very important so this is the role of endoscopy correct now what is the role of urea test so rapid urea test is basically it needs 10 to the power of 5 bacteria 10 to the power of 5 bacteria for it to become positive and you need to always stop ppi for 4 weeks h2 blockers for 1 week and antibiotics also for 4 weeks before doing the rapid urea test in case you are not able to stop then you have to either take a more proximal biopsy or you have to come out and do a uh, urea breath test there's no other way so you have to if you find that the rapid urea test is negative you have to wait for 24 hours to declare negative and you should never do it in a very cold room because it might take a long time to show positivity and if the patient is having profuse gi bleed or if there's any atrophy then the bacteria will not survive in that region so if you find that the during endoscopy if there's the entire uh, um, uh, field is flooded with blood then you cannot take a biopsy so you have to come out and do it at a later stage or you have to do a urea uh, breath urea test and uh, uh, confirm your diagnosis on that basis okay so why peptic ulcer disease is now the second most common cause of dyspepsia correct so all our uh, goal is to find out if there's any peptic ulcer disease due to h pylori why we call it as peptic is because the action of pepsin the pepsin is going to cause the breakage it becomes proteolytic at the acidic ph it's not the acid that is causing the problem per se it is the pep pepsin that is going to be proteolytic okay so uh, there are a lot of conditions in which uh, peptic ulcer disease gets aggravated even more these are important for you to know because they've been asked so advanced age COPD, chronic renal failure, cirrhosis, nephrolithiasis, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, mastocytosis. So these are the important causes. And the ones that are probably associated with peptic ulcer disease are hyperparathyroidism, CAD, polycythemia, chronic pancreatitis, former alcohol use, obesity, African-American race, and three or more doctor visits in one year. So these are all the risk factors. These are all the probably associations of peptic ulcer disease that one has to keep in mind. So Coming to the summary again, if you are finding that the patient is having dyspepsia and you didn't find anything in the UGS copy and the biopsy was also negative for H. pylori and there are no particular cancers, there is no NSIDUs, nothing, you're going to call the patient as functional dyspepsia and label it as two types. One is postprandial distress syndrome and epigastric pain syndrome. These are patients who are having three months or more of a problem and the problem starts six months ago. Postprandial distress syndrome has postprandial fullness and early satiety, whereas epigastric pain and epigastric burning is present here. Now, if suppose you have to treat with H. pylori, you can treat and finish it off at this age, this uh, this level. If you if there is no need to do it, then you have to go with the treatment. I told you that time only postprandial distress syndrome needs a prokinetic. You can add PPI if you want, whereas an epigastric pain syndrome requires a PPI. You can add a prokinetic if you want. So this two important differences you have to understand. If prokinetic is not working, you go with acosiamide. Acosiamide is basically a, a fundic relaxer. So the, basically the receptor relaxation in the fundus of the stomach increases. If you give acosiamide, that leads to improved satiety. Its satiety will become less. So that means the patient can eat more and be more, uh, have less indigestion. So that is acosiamide. If you can't use that, then you're going to use 5-HT1A agonist uh, like uh, uh, buspirone or mirtazapine. So you can use these two drugs. Even after this, if it's not responding, then there probably lies a idiopathic gastroparesis. So in that case, you're going to do a gastric empty study. So if you do a gastric empty study at the end of four hours of the gastric, uh, after eating a meal, after four hours of eating a meal, if more than 90% of the entire food is staying inside your stomach, then that, that means there is delayed gastric empty. So then you have to start looking for other causes of gastroparesis and treat them. Most common is being diabetes. So this is about postprandial distress. So you're going to give prokinetic, acosiamide, mirtrazepine and treat and look for cause of delayed gastric empty. If the patient has epigastric pain, you're going to start with a PPI. After giving PPI, four to eight weeks, you will give PPI. And then you will stop. Please understand that you have to stop the PPI and not continue the PPI. After giving PPI, you will stop the PPI therapy. And after giving the PPI therapy, you have to try SSRI. Okay, SSRI or TTI. Please remember SSRI is not in the, in the treatment for postprandial distress, but it's there in the treatment for epigastric pain syndrome. Okay. Uh, even after SSRI also, if it's not going to work, then you're going to give CBT or any particular psychotherapy. 
Okay. So always remember in epigastric pain syndrome, the PPI has to be stopped and then you have to go for other particular treatment. Okay. So this is, the, this is about functional dyspepsia, diagnosis of functional dyspepsia, which is the most common cause of uh, dyspepsia and two parts in the uh, functional dyspepsia component and how do you treat each of them. This is the most common cause of dyspepsia. This is only if you have done UGScopy, you have ruled out other causes, you have done basic tests like LFT, USG and found out and you have done a proper physical examination. So you should not be able to miss some early gastric cancer just because you have not done a UGScopy or you should not miss a pancreatic biliary disorder because you have not done LFT. You have to do all that and then come to a diagnosis of functional dyspepsia. Okay. Next important thing is in peptic ulcer disease, the most common cause of peptic ulcer disease is undoubtedly H. pylori. Now, in H. pylori, I have already told you when to test. We have we follow something called as the Maastricht criteria. So, Maastricht criteria is what is a consensus criteria from the Netherlands, which tells you what, how to diagnose and how to treat peptic ulcer disorders. We are currently in the Maastricht five, but uh, Harrison mentions only till up to four. Okay. So basically, please don't get confused. There are a lot of H. pylori treatments, but please remember the most important one and which is FDA approved. The one that is FDA approved is a clarithromycin triple therapy. Okay. Clarithromycin triple therapy, which is given for two weeks. Okay. That is the one that is FDA approved. But, but the problem lies here is because India has a higher resistance of clarithromycin. If clarithromycin resistance is more than 15%, you can't use clarithromycin. Similarly, if metronidazole is more than 40% resistance, you can't use metronidazole. In that case, we are supposed to use other therapies, but the other therapies are not FDA approved. So, but whatever it is, 14, durations, 14 days duration therapy is definitely there and there's no role for dual therapy. Clarithromycin triple therapy is basically very simple. You have to give a PPI. You have to have a PPI for anything. Plus, you're going to give clarithromycin. Either you add this with Amox or you add this with metronidazole. So it's either TAC or TMC. Either Amox or metronidazole. This is basically the triple base therapy that is FDA approved. But we cannot use it because there is resistance. So in that case, we are the next best choice we have is bismuth. Bismuth quadruple therapy is what we currently use because this is the most effective, but it is more difficult to comply with because you have to take almost three times a day or four times a day also. But whatever it is, it is 14 days with bismuth quadruple therapy, wherein there is probably no metronidazole and clarithromycin also. You can use levofloxacin based or furazolidine based if you have salvage therapy. When the treatment is not, if the treatment is resistant, then we go to salvage therapies. Whatever it is, you have to please remember that H. pylori should be eradicated in patients with documented POD. If you have documented there's an ulcer, you have to go, you have to biopsy the ulcer, prove that it is benign and then treat it. After you have treated also, even a, even a benign ulcer, if you have documented a benign gastric ulcer, after you have done an endoscopy and treated, you have to go do a repeat endoscopy to confirm that there's some kind of healing. If healing is fully done, then only you can say, okay, I have finished my treatment. If suppose your uh, treatment is not fully done or the he healing is not fully done, and that means that probably it could would be a malignant ulcer because even a benign ulcer will turn to be malignant later on. That is why the only indication to do a repeat endoscopy in the case of PUD is if, uh, if, if there's a benign ulcer that has not healed properly. So all benign ulcers, benign gastric ulcers, you have to finish your treatment, go to the, go do the endoscopy again and find out if there's full healing or if there's any particular re-bleeding again, that is probably, you know, suspecting you to be um, suspecting it to become malignant. So that's very important for you to do that. Okay. So this is the uh, algorithm for you to find out the treatment strategies in H. pylori. If, if there is macrolide, uh, macrolide resistance, so, or if there's penicillin allergy, let us assume that there is penicillin allergy and macro, uh, uh, macrolide exposure is there previously or resistance is there previously, then it is bismuth quadruple. If you look at this, bismuth quadruple is present in almost all treatments. So it's very safe to use. Okay. Sometimes you, know, you never know in our current scenario, if a macrolide has been given previously to the patient or not. So then we have to just assume that macrolide uh, exposure is there previously. Okay, so that is the most important uh, thing that you have to do uh, is uh, find out if there's any macrolide exposure or macrolide resistance and you have to treat. So first line treatment is bismuth quadruple in India practically. FDA approved is clarithromycin triple. Now suppose after treating this, you, you give two more weeks of PPI. Okay, so you've given PPI for totally of four weeks. 
After this, you have to go for, eradi uh, for confirmation of eradication by urea breath test or stool antigen test. So once you have confirmed the eradication, your treatment is full. Except if there's a benign gastric ulcer, then you have to do a re-endoscopy re re uh, to find out if there's healing or if there's any bleeding or some other complications. That is the entire treatment of dyspepsia if there's a PUD and if H. pylori is positive. Okay. If H. pylori is negative and there is no other causes in the endoscopy, then you can label the patient as having functional dyspepsia. Okay. If you look at this, please concentrate on few things only. If you look at everything, you'll get confused. Please remember clarithromycin triple as the only FDA approved treatment here. That is PCA or you can give PCM also. That is clarithromycin triple. Because resistance is uh, there, we're going to prefer bismuth. So in bismuth, we can either make, uh, we can do we can do PPI, bismuth, tetracycline, met metronidazole. If you metronidazole resistance is more than 40%, you can add levofloxacin also. Okay, these treatments are actually quite complicated, but they're not shown to have more benefit more than the other. Okay, levofloxacin, rifabutin therapy, levofloxacin therapy are all salvage therapies. Okay, they're used only if more than uh, first line is uh, uh, not working and you have second line therapy. In second line therapy, always you have to do an endoscopy to document uh, eradication and document healing of any particular ulcer if you are giving if you are doing a second line therapy or a salvage therapy uh, you have to always prove again with the uh, endoscopy you have to diagnose with an endoscopy there is no role for urea breath test in second line therapy of h pylori like i told you if a gastric or a duodenal ulcer is noted, triple therapy is recommended for 14 days followed by two weeks of acid suppression for a total of 4 to 6 weeks now, H. pylori eradication should be documented four weeks after completing antibiotics, and that is better with urea breath test than stool antigens. So, this is the summary if you find a particular ulcer or a cause for the peptic ulcer. So, gastric ulcer, unless proven, then please assume that they have a very high malignant potential, and hence any benign gastric ulcer also has to be documented to have healing or some uh, without any complications after finishing your entire therapy. Okay, not just urea breath test, but also a gastric ulcer and all gastric ulcer obviously has to be biopsy without any doubt. If a gastric ulcer is not healing by 12 weeks of therapy or if a duodenal ulcer is not healing by 8 weeks of therapy, then we call this as refractory peptic ulcer. A refractory peptic ulcer, you know, uh, you have to start thinking of the risk factor control. That is the most important thing. Whether the treatment is going properly, the patient is still smoking and having alcohol uh, abuse, or if uh, you need higher dose, if there's ongoing N NSI uh, consumption, or if there's any particular malignancy or zoligar Ellison syndrome. In this case, you have to get a serum fa fasting gastrin levels and diagnose if there's any zoligar Ellison syndrome. zoligar Ellison syndrome will have hypergastronemia, which might lead to refractory PUDs in areas where PUD is not supposed to be there. In the third part, fourth part of the duodenum, intestinal ulcers, esophageal ulcers, etc. So that is important for you to find out if there is any zoligar Ellison syndrome, syndrome in a patient with refractory PUD. After confirming the risk factors have been controlled properly and patient is not taking in any NSIs also without knowing. Okay. There are rarer disease of refractory ulcers like ischemia, Crohn's disease, amyloidosis, sarcoidosis, lymphoma, eosinophilic gastroenteritis, smoking, uh, smoking crack, cocaine, etc and infections like cytomegalovirus, tuberculosis, and syphilis. So all these causes can be easily picked up by biopsy. That's why we go ahead and do UGI scopy in cases of uh, patients with more than 60 years of age, alarm symptoms, or symptoms that are persistent after full treatment also. Okay. So in summary, we have learned today about dyspepsia. Okay. Dyspepsia basically is a symptom, four symptom complex, and these are different from heartburn, Okay, these are different from regurgitation. These are different from water brush. Okay, these are all representing esophageal symptoms. Okay, so if dyspepsia is present and you're sure about it, then first, first and foremost, rule out H. pylori. By ruling out H. pylori, either you can do by urea breath test or by stool antigen test or by biopsy urea test. Anything can be done. But why would you want to do biopsy urea test when you can do a non invasive test? So you do non-invasive tests in a patient who doesn't have any alarm features or is, is a patient who is young. If you find that the patient is old or if you find that there's any symptoms and signs suggestive of alarm symptoms, then you go do a UGI scopy, take biopsy for proving urease activity or and you have to see for other causes and of dyspepsia, other complications of H. pylori and other problems with the duodenum or the esophagus that requires treatment. After doing all this, if you find H. pylori to be positive, then treat it. 
If you find no problem at all and the diagnosis of H. pylori is negative, then you label it as functional dyspepsia. And functional dyspepsia is the most common cause of dyspepsia. In this case, you have two types, which is postprandial distress syndrome and epigastric pain syndrome. And the treatment with this is prokinetics and acosiamide. And the treatment of this is PPI with SSRIs. The role of UGI is to pick up the role of UGI first, please don't say the role of UGI is to, uh, to confirm diagnosis of H. pylori. It is not for confirmation of H. pylori. You can confirm, uh, uh, confirm H. pylori using other techniques. The role of UGI scopy is to find out if there are complications or any cancer that you can treat immediately. And if there are problems in the uh, gastroduodenal tract that can cause dyspepsia, or if you find out esophageal problems or extraduodenal problems that are there, that can probably lead to other symptoms, but not dyspepsia. That is why you do UGI scopy. Along with that, you end up having a gift of taking the biopsy for proving H. pylori. So H. pylori testing can be done in many ways and all ways are actually all methods are good. good. You rapid urease test, urea breath test and stool antigen test. You can do any of this. If by UJ scopy, if you find a lot of bleeding and you couldn't take the sample for uh, rapid urease test, you can go ahead and do any of these also and they are also equal. So this is the summary of dyspepsia. In the next few sessions, I'll be talking about uh, the other GI symptoms that are important mainly esophageal and lower GI tract and bleeding. So if there's any issues or doubts, please let me know. I'll answer them.